Welcome. We're on the red couch with Josh Aronson, Oscar-nominated filmmaker whose most recent film, Orchestra of Exiles, tells a story known by few. It's the story of Bronislaw Huberman, a violin prodigy who founded the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra, which provided salvation for over a thousand of the most accomplished Jewish musicians during the rise of Nazi Germany. Through Aronson Films, he directed MTV videos, television, pilots and specials, and over 500 commercials before turning to documentaries in 1999. Since then, Josh has made award-winning do award documentaries on a fascinating variety of topics. Josh, I am thrilled to have you on the red couch. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Now, you started as a time life still photographer. I did. And did that lead you to film? Uh, in a way, it led me to film because I, I was a time life photographer while I was in college in New York because I went to school during the revolution, as we say, the Vietnam riots of 68, right. 69, 70. Right. And uh, I had taken my book to Time Life, and because I was at Columbia University where the buildings had been occupied by the students, they gave me a press pass and said, see if you can get in, because they weren't allowing press in. But because I was a student, they let me in, huh. and I took pictures that were in Time Life magazine, and I sort of got in by a piece of luck, and then I was a photographer for them. But I learned in working in stills that I really missed people, and I missed the, the dynamism of working with a group. And while I was in college, I made a film and got hooked and uh, never looked back to stills. Wow. Yeah. So how did you get from mm -hmm. all the MTV commercials and all that stuff to documentaries? How did I get from... Well, uh, I'm, I did, as, as you said, I, I made a lot of different kinds of films. But my basic business for 15 to 20 years was in the advertising business. And I made television commercials, first as a producer and then finally as a director. And I had a company and a lot of directors. And it was very, you know, it was very heady and exciting. And, uh, you know, commercials are, uh, give you the illusion that you're actually making something important mm -hmm. because they're expensive and they're big and you get to play with all the toys Right. You know, I mean, helicopters and cranes and the things that we filmmakers think of as toys. But at the end of the day, after years of it, you realize that it's really not about the toys. And it's mm -hmm. not about the stuff. It's about the film that you're making. And it's about the pieces of communication that you're making. Um, and over and over again, I found I was making the same commercial. Mm -hmm. And it would go on the air and sometimes be great, sometimes not so great. Sometimes it would sell, sell products, sometimes it wouldn't. But finally, at the end of the day, it was a disposable piece of media. And what is there to say about it? You know, you're in business selling products. Mm. And I really got to a place I wanted to see if I had anything to say. And growing up, it, being a, a still photographer first and then a young filmmaker, I always dreamed about making movies, like everybody right. does. All you guys, I'm sure, are dreaming about making movies of some kind or sto telling stories, really. Right. And although commercials certainly are stories of 30 seconds duration, uh, I wanted to do things that maybe had a little more impact in the world. And um, having made uh, uh, commercials, I had an attention span this, this, the, the length of a gnat. You know, you know, so <laughs> right. You'd get a job, and you'd do it, and you'd get paid, and you'd go on to the next. So trying to make feature films, narrative feature films, takes years and years to do. And documentaries seemed like a faster route. So I looked for a story, and I found one after a year of searching for the right story, and that became my first documentary, and I've, I never looked back. Wow. Well, this particular story about Huberman, I mean, it's incredible to me that it's such an inspiring story, and yet so few people knew about it. Mm -hmm. How did you come to find out about it or hear about him? Well, when you're a documentary filmmaker that's made a couple of films, Everyone you know, all of your friends, has a great story that you have to make into a movie. <laughs> and, they right. and they come to you and they'll say, Josh, I've got this great story, and they pitch you this story. And the job is to be very polite and listen to it because most of them are you know, films that you are not interested in making. Mm -hmm. now, I found a long time ago that documentary films are so difficult uh, to make that you don't want to be making a film unless you are totally committed to it, unless mm -hmm. it's really grabbed you, because uh, it's just too hard. And it's, they're not lucrative. They're not... Uh, um, what do we say? It's it's not fun unless you feel as if you know you really touch something in yourself and you have to tell this story it's right. on one level or another. Um, and so I had this personal monitor that if it engages me and continues to stay with me and then starts to grow, you know, then I'll look at it and let it marinate a little bit, you know, and then I'll read a little bit and I'll do some research. And if it continues to stay with me, I'll pursue it. So. Uh, 
that happens a lot, that people will come to you and you, dis, you, know, you push them aside because there's no interest. Well, I have a friend um, who's an amateur pianist, as I am, and we share a piano teacher. Uh, so we know each other through the world of music. And she's Israeli, and she's uh, middle-aged, and uh, lives in New York City. And she came to me and said that she'd had an epiphany. And then she realized that her entire family was alive because of uh, the actions of one man mm. in 1936. And uh, she told me the story of Branislav Huberman taking her father in 1936 from Vienna to Palestine to be part of an orchestra that Huberman was starting. And that was kind of the extent of what she told me. And she said, so Huberman saved my father, and then my father married and had children, and one of them was me, and so someone should make a film about my father and Branislav Huberman. Well, I, uh, <laughs> it didn't sound like such a great story. It sounded like a personal story for her. So, but she's Israeli, so she's a little pushy. So she tried again. And she came back, and I, I was polite, and I said, her name is Dorit. I said, Dorit, tell me a little more about this Bronislav Huberman guy, who I had never heard of, and I'm embarrassed to say that I'd never heard of him. And so she told me uh, about this man who was a world-renowned violinist in the early part of the 20th century, and um, that he'd played in Palestine, and he loved Palestine. He loved the audiences in Palestine for music. And uh, that when Hitler started firing the musicians from the great orchestras of Germany, he got an idea to start an orchestra. And, and she told me a vague version of that story. Right. And so it was enough for me to go back and start to research it. And in a couple of days, I realized that, in fact, this was a great story. Not the story she had told me about her father. Her father was just an ancillary character. But the story of this man, Branislav Huberman, who was one of the great violinists of the century, who was born in Poland as a Jew, he was a non-practicing Jew, who was a, uh, um, a great, great prodigy. Mm -hmm. He played for Brahms in 1896, um, played the Brahms concerto for Brahms in the audience when he was 12 years old, and Brahms dubbed him a, a young genius artist, and that sort of launched his career. His father took him out of school, took him away from musical education, just to put him on the road to make money, like Mozart and his father. It's a Mozart story. And uh, later, P uh, when I interviewed Pinkus Zuckerman in this film, he talked about what it is to be a prodigy and how, you know, there's a parent who's always sort of on top of things like that. And, uh, you know, and, and of course, Pinkus Zuckerman was a similar kind of prodigy, but with a better parenting. Right. But Branislav Huberman was abused in that he had no relationship with his mother, he had no relationship with his brothers or family, and he was just put on the road for 10 years with his father. Uh, his father finally died, and Huberman, at 20, realized that he didn't know anything, and then educated himself, and finally stopped playing and went to the Sorbonne to be, get a master's in sociology and politics, hmm. completely on his own. And he stopped a highly lucrative career to do that, and then s recreated himself as a v highly altruistic man, interested in politics, and he became a great humanitarian, and interested in the world picture, and obviously was an extraordinary thinker and extraordinary mind. So here is this character who was living in the world. He was playing concerts around the world. Right. He had played in Palestine once or twice and was stunned by the power of the audiences there, by the thirst for the audiences mm. there for classical music. That's cool. And it's not so surprising because the people in Palestine in 19... First he was there in 29, then 31. The people in Palestine at that time, the Jews in Palestine at that time, had come from Moscow, they'd come from Central Europe, and they were idealistic Zionists. Mm -hmm. And they had been doctors and professors, and they may be working on kibbutzes as farmers, but they were highly educated people, right. very sophisticated. Yeah. And they wanted classical culture, and it wasn't there. And Huberman you know, would give 10 concerts, and they would be lined up around the streets. Mm. And so he said uh, later, he said, if the same percentage of Jews in New York had gone to his concerts who had gone to the concerts in Palestine, there would be 300,000 Jews at every concert at Carnegie Hall. Wow. I mean, that was the proportion that he yeah. saw. So he recognized that there was a real need for an audience, a real need for an orchestra in Palestine. But it was very difficult. How do you build an orchestra, a high-quality orchestra, in the desert, in the middle of the Middle East, in 1936? Yeah, 1931. It's extraordinary. At the time? It was impossible. So he would go out and he would tour the world and so on. 1933, Hitler comes to power, and Hitler started firing Jews from the great orchestras immediately. And so you know, he came to power in January, and by April there were notices all across Germany, and Jews were no longer allowed to play in orchestras, mm. and the Jews were often the best players in the orchestra. 
So for the first time in history, the greatest players of Europe were available. Right. Now think about that. Right, right. They were available. Good right? point, yeah. Because when you want to start an orchestra of 100 men and women, to get good players, it takes 100 years to build an orchestra. Wow. 100 years to build wow. a great orchestra. I mean, Vienna, Berlin, New York, these orchestras took 100 years to build. So uh, he had this aha moment of cultural history, which served two purposes, well, more than two, but the main two. One was getting these players, picking them, only the best players, right. convincing them to move because no one knew what was coming in 1936. Mm -hmm. You know, there was bad racial policies and there was horrible anti-Semitism that was happening, but no one knew what was coming in 1939. Right, and you a lot know, of people hoped that Hitler was just going to go away and the whole thing wasn't going to really happen the way it happened. It's easy to see in hindsight, right? Exactly right. And people thought that the, that the, you know, they were just beer hall goons in the Nazi party, the SS, and so on. They were just uneducated, beer hall, you know, belligerent, fascistic kind of people. And they thought, this is, this is the Germany of Beethoven and Mozart and Heine, and there was no mm, way right. that this could stay. But forces of history, forces of the inflation, the 2,000% inflation that was happening in Berlin at the time, there was an interesting confluence of things, and, and National Socialism, Nazism stayed. But no one knew that. Mm -hmm. So Huberman had to use his celebrity and his power and his powers of persuasion to convince people that it was very dangerous, only going to get more dangerous, and to convince 60 or 70 of the very best players to move to Palestine to start an orchestra. Well, at the same time, of course, these 60 or 70 players brought their, their husbands and wives, they brought their children, they right. brought their parents because they could get them out and into Palestine. So Huberman effectively saved hundreds and hundreds of Jews right. by starting the cultural history of, of, um, of Israel. He brought the seeds of culture from Europe to Palestine and insisted that all the players teach because they had to pass it on to the next generation. Right, it's beautiful. And Itzhak Perlman and Pinkus Zuckerman both said, as Zubin Mehta did when I interviewed him, that without Huberman, the culture of Israel today would not be as dynamic. Wow. There was no doubt about that. 